ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, if, like the Yo Valley team, you were in the bar at two o'clock this morning when they switched the lights off, well done. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, Nicole Masters is on too, so really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> All right, <laughs> don't, don't leave now. Um, we're going to talk about agroforestry wood pasture today. Um, my name's Tom White, and I'm the Regen Farming Manager at Yo Valley. Um, and wood pasture is something we're really ex excited about and enthused by, but it is uh, quite new to us. So when asked to do a groundswell talk about it, I decided to cheat entirely, and we had a little short film made that I'm hopefully going to show you if the PowerPoint plays ball, um, and then invited some real experts to come. Um, would you guys like to introduce yourselves at this point? Nikki? Yeah, hi, I'm Nikki Oxall. Um, I wear a couple of hats. I work for Pasture for Life as head of research, um, but I also run Grampy and Graziers, which is a grazing business in the northeast of Scotland where we produce 100% pasture and tree-fed beef. Um, and we work predominantly with local landowners and uh, we're also just entering into a share farming agreement with a neighbour as well. So, yeah, that's us. Um, hi, I'm Harriet Bell. I'm the regenerative farming lead uh, for Riverford Organic Farmers, which is an organic uh, veg and meat box delivery scheme. Um, and we're trying to integrate agroforestry as much as we possibly can into our supply chain in, in ways that support the farm businesses. Super, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, the Yo Valley um, Wood Pasture Project, um, because that's the context which I'm coming to this from. And then hopefully we can open up for experiences and, um, and what you guys have been working on. So we run a regen farming project, um, which we cover off various work streams, a lot of data gathering, a lot of looking at um, soil um, and the practices which we're going to bring to bear on um, in delivering the various outcomes we want to see from our farming system. Um, and, and within that project, we have four work streams that we look at, and those are mob grazing, composting, diverse cropping, and agroforestry. Um, and agroforestry is what we're going to dive into today. Um, so, oh, There's this is something the unexpected going on in Yo Valley's woods. Project. It's a unique project at the cutting edge of agriculture that's rooted in farming history. Yo Valley Organics Woodland Pasture Project will become the workable blueprint for woodland pasture on a scale unseen in the UK. We started with 400 acres, thinning the trees, letting in sunlight, allowing grasses to grow. Then we added cattle. Over the next decade, our woodland pasture will grow to a thousand acres, becoming the largest in Britain. The woodland will ultimately be shared between trees, shrubs, grass, cattle, and greater biodiversity. Because when agriculture and forestry come together, good things happen. The cattle have a more diverse diet, foraging on trees as well as pasture. They find shelter from the elements and a calm in the woodland. Forest living suits them. By simply doing what comes naturally, our cattle are helping to create a healthy, biodiverse environment at one with nature. Our project will provide an in-depth understanding of how woodland pasture works at scale how biodiversity is increased, and how pasture and woodland are so much more together. But it's not just about what you can see. Woodland pasture also helps tackle an invisible threat, too much carbon in the atmosphere that causes climate change. Trees and grass draw harmful carbon from the air, locking it away beneath ground, where it nourishes and maintains healthy soil. Our vision is for woodland pasture 
to become one of the best practices in sustainable farming, where innovative, nature-friendly organic farming is part of the solution. Working towards a future where cows living in the woods isn't such a big surprise. Right. Um, we love pe taking people to see our wood pasture, but um, we can't take everyone uh, as much as we might have tried. So th the film was made to try and give an idea of the feel um, that's developing there. Um, because one of the things that we observe time and time again is how people react to it when they walk in there and look at it. Um, it seems to bring joy, uh, which is quite, a, quite an interesting thing. But I'll just try to give you a bit of detail. So um, the piece of land that, um, that we're doing this on is a 600-acre um, farm, um, and about 400 acres of it are 20-year-old plantation woodland, which is um, planted to more than 65% ash, which is suffering very, very badly. So it's slightly unique from um, an agroforestry point of view because we have a woodland that's rapidly taking itself towards being much less dense. Uh, and because it's only 20 years old, what's happening underneath largely is that grass is growing. So when we started thinning the trees, and I'll try and find the correct pictures here. Um, there we go, oh, back again. Uh, when we started thinning the trees, uh, uh, and light started getting in, grass started growing. Um, this was, uh, so, so these pictures are showing you what, what are effectively our starting point. So the picture on the left shows you the density of the trees when we take it on. They're planted on two meter spacings um, and uh, pr probably putting aside the ash dieback issue are well overdue thinning. Um, so when, when we bought this site in 2018, um, it was in need of management. Um, and once we have got in and started to open up, um, the picture um, w without the leaves on the trees there is showing you the kind of density that we're ending at, at a, up at. It, it varies quite a lot depending on how the ash was planted, um, but that's kind of what it ends up looking like. Um, thank you. Um, and so in May 2022, we decided that because this grass was, was starting to, to grow, we really needed to get some cattle in there. Um, so we, we moved them in, uh, and things started to develop very, very quickly. Um, just 68 days later, so in the first grazing round, we're mob grazing within this system on, on a long recovery, um, we had grass that was up to our chests, which was really quite amazing to see. Um, and what we've seen now over the last three years is that this system develops very, very quickly. Um, could you move me on again? Um, in some areas, we have started to um, put, put some seed in, um, where we have done some bramble removals and where we've had machinery in. Um, and there's, um, I can share this, if anybody's interested, Cotswold Seeds um, developed us a mix, um, which um, is suited to a slightly shadier environment. But one of the things that we're finding, and one of the reasons why I'm so keen to speak to guys like I have with me, is because there is not a huge amount of information in there about how, out there, about how to manage these systems about the kind of the swords that we'd expect, the, the, the species that, that we might want to use if we're trying to um, move things towards a, a really working grazing system. Um, and I can tell you that for those who love a plate meter, it really does not work within this environment. It all goes out the window uh, when you have the diversity of species and, and types of plants that we have. Um, so we've been um, grazing there now um, for uh, a year and a half. Um, numbers have been building, um, and we have learned very quickly that the cattle, um, and these are beef cattle out of the dairy herd that we're running in this system, uh, are really um, very calm, very relaxed, and very contented within this environment. Um, and we've experienced um, the, the microclimate in last year's drought, which had seemed to have a really significant effect on the cattle. Um, and, and taking that forwards, a couple of the, the trials that we've been running over the top of this are using no-fence collars within the woodland to be able to um, manage grazing areas, um, and they 
have been really successful. Uh, I wasn't sure whether they would work within the trees, but, they, but I can tell you that they do. Um, and we also did an outwintering trial, um, which on the top of Mendip uh, in Somerset is, is, is not something that's done very often, and which is often associated with a lot of soil damage. Um, but we, um, last year, had quite a low number of animals for the area that we had, so we were confident going into the winter that we could um, do a good job of it, and that went fine. Um, we were really pleased at the end of February when everyone was expecting the winter to start to end, and then it went on and on and on. Um, but it, the cattle looked well all winter uh, within that environment, and I think we've seen the microclimate effect of this woodland in both uh, in 2022 in the uh, extremes of the summer and the extremes of the winter, which is, has already started to kind of prove out some of what we think and hope might happen within this environment. Um, and I, I know, um, sorry, could you go back to, that's it, thank you. Um, I, kn I know if I was sitting in this talk, I'd be looking for loads of detail on stocking densities, daily live weight gain, and all those sorts of things. Uh, the truth is, with our system, it's really very new, um, and there's more land coming on all the time, and there is more livestock coming on all the time. Um, one of the reasons for us doing this was that within our 2,000-acre farm with two dairy units, we wanted to be able to keep all of the young stock, uh, all of the beef that's born of that, that dairy system, on our, on our farms, and this is the platform that's allowing us to do that. So you can see there, for those that are interested, that um, both the acres available to us and the number of livestock is growing up until the point where we're, we're probably keeping 150 animals there. Um, what I would say is, is our observation is that if you're doing this, if you're, and, and I understand it's quite a unique situation that we have, um, if you are introducing pasture and beef into a woodland, uh, the development is very fast, but it's certainly not showing any times any sign of stopping developing yet. And I think whilst we have made um, a kind of guess at where we that the number of animals we might might carry, I think I think we'll turn out to be able to carry a lot more than that should we want to, or to stack other enterprises, which we might talk about. Um, <laughs> yeah, and on again, please. OK, so um, our, our observations, it being that we're, we are new to this, we're in our second year, we're lucky that we have this large-scale platform, which we think is going to generate lots of really useful and interesting data. Um, but uh, you know, at this point, our, our, what we have are our observations. So within the growing season last year, uh, daily live weight gains were about 0.7 kilos. Um, which I know some uh, of the beef guys might not think sets the world on fire, but things were going forwards quite nicely all the time. And these are, uh, a lot of these animals are purebred dairy bull calves um, on what we wouldn't think of as being massively productive grasses. So we were really very pleased with that. Um, and I think we'll continue to be able to move that forward as we optimize the grazing and the sward continues to develop. Uh, and even over the winter, um, they averaged um, with some bale grazing. 0.45 kilos, um, which, which again, we, we were really pleased with. Um, the impact of shade and shelter I've spoken about uh, can't be understated. Uh, and I think, you know, we're uh, in the southwest, probably lots of the rest of the country, we're possibly uh, heading towards another drought right now for the second year running. Uh, you know, I think not sh shade and shelter is very important, but it's becoming more important as we move forwards. And it's something that we're really interested in. Um, and, I th and whilst this is a beef platform, um, uh, I think you, you might have heard that in the video we have an, uh, uh, an aim to get to 1,000 acres of agroforestry, and that will mean that once we've got this 400-acre platform online, we'll be planting into permanent pastures. That might be on a different format, but providing shelter and shade will really be a significant part of how we form that, and hopefully Harriet can advise us uh, a lot there as well. Um, broadcasting seed um, and the grazing changes very, very quickly. Cattle are extremely calm um, and take tree forage very readily, uh, as we saw in the film, which is, again is, is an amazing thing. So um, I, I wanted to give an overview of what we're doing. We're new to it, um, but equally I'm aware there may be academics, there may be interested parties, people in the audience who um, we recognize that this, this platform, because of its scale, is, is, is quite, well, we're very excited about it. And if there's anyone who thinks there's a useful link, wants to come forward and talk to us about doing anything here, we understand that whilst we'll be monitoring lots of things, we probably need help and connections, um, and that there might be things we haven't thought of yet to measure uh, and, and monitor there. So, uh, you know, really welcome um, 
that going forwards. So it's probably about enough from me. Could you move on again? Nikki, could you tell us Thanks, about Tom. your experiences <laughs> with cows in trees? Yeah, sure. I'm not actually s sure how many slides I've got in front of me, so that's going to be fun. We'll work that out as we go <laughs> through. Um, but yeah, so uh, as I said, we run um, two groups, two herds, predominantly of cattle in northeast Scotland, but we also take on some contract grazing for different people. And um, we are um, have had the incredible opportunity of working with some brilliant local landowners, who also are here, so thank you to you guys, um, to access woodland for grazing. So as I said, we work with different people. Um, yeah, if you want to like maybe drop back one, we can... Perfect. We'll stick on that one for a bit because it's a nice photo. Um, and it gives a really nice example of some of the old uh, birch woodland that we're grazing in. So uh, our cattle are predominantly Shetland, also um, Galloway, and we also now have just set up this second uh, pedigree Angus herd. And we are um, grazing in existing woodland. And I'm, um, I always find it really interesting because I talk a lot about silver pasture and um, agroforestry generally. And for many people, it's that kind of starting point of going out and planting trees. And what I think is really exciting about the Yo Valley project and what we're doing is actually we're integrating cattle into existing woodland. So it's quite a different, you know, you're kind of making the most of what's already there rather than kind of starting from scratch. Um, there's so much that I could talk about, so you guys might just have to tell me to shut up at some point. But I guess one of the key things that really jumped out for me in, in what Tom was saying was about grass management in woodland is really different from grass management in pasture. Um, whether that's about the species composition, the rate at which the grass grows, um, the, the, the rest. And I feel like actually in quite shaded woodland, so some of the woodland that we actually have on our home block, um, it could probably, it actually needs thinning, and we'll probably do a bit of thinning over the next few years. But um, I have found that it doesn't, the grass doesn't really respond to normal, how you'd expect it to with your normal rest period. You know, so if you're mob grazing or you're in any sort of rotation, you kind of know what to expect the grass to do after a particular rest period. And those rules don't really apply in woodland. And I, I'm still really kind of getting my eye in on that. And it's, um, yeah, it's a tricky one. And, and plate meters and sword sticks just don't, they also don't apply. So you just have to kind of trust your gut with it. Um, but, you know, moving the cattle daily for us is, is, is great because it means that we can, you know, we can see that grass growth. We can start planning ahead, but it doesn't really fit within, um, you know, like farm acts or anything like that or agri-web. It would be difficult to, to manage and kind of man, uh, manage a grass wedge ahead of you when you're grazing in woodland. So that's one thing, I guess, just to say that, you know, definitely go and try this stuff, but you, it will be very different on every farm, in every woodland, um, how that grass responds, and you just have to kind of get your eye in and get used to it. Um, the species composition as well. Um, I mean, we don't do any reseeds at all on any of the pasture that we manage, um, so we're always making the most of existing naturalised native grasses and plants, um, and the woodland really um, is fantastic for that, and we, we see brilliant responses to flowering plants throughout the, the growing season. Um, so yeah, so I guess that's a bit about the sward. In terms of the um, the trees themselves, for us, daily moves are really important. And if not daily, definitely no more than three days. And that's something that we would uh, apply in field, but also in the woodland. I think there's concerns about kind of damage to trees and over browsing, and that definitely is something that you would want to avoid. Um, none of the woodland, no, that's not true. The majority of the woodland that we're grazing at the moment isn't isn't needed as a timber crop um it's about you know kind of ancient woodland or um uh, landscape um um uh, interest and biodiversity it's not necessarily about producing timber um a couple of the couple of the woodland blocks that we are now testing out some of this stuff in is for timber so you just have to be really conscious of that like you know how how much impact can i have on these trees um there are um, opportunities for if anyone here is in Scotland, there is some is from Scotland where, where I am based. There are some really great opportunities for funding through the Woodland Grazing Toolkit to actually bring animals into woodland, um, which is very underutilised. So if you are in Scotland, have a look at that um, that scheme. Um, in terms of health, welfare, all of those things, I cannot uh, stress en enough how amazing putting cattle into woodland is. Um, Two years ago, no, three years ago, we carved in the woodlands, and it was just amazing. Um, 
it was a really, really cold spring, uh, and we had, um, where we are in Scotland, it's, you know, grass doesn't really grow until the mid-end of May, and uh, we were having frosts um, and, and, a light and, and snow in May, and it was just amazing to see how the calves could, like, hunker down into dead wood, you know, trees that had fallen over, and they could just get in there and shelter. So that was really, really great. Obviously, the shade, the shelter benefits, there's loads of research to support this as well. Um, there's a lot of research that has already gone on globally around um, the benefits for um, for production, around um, both in terms of weight gain, um, lactation, you know, throughout the lactation, and when it would be important to give more shade um, to support milk yield, but also fertility. Um, you know, heat stress can really, as I'm sure many of you know, heat stress will have a significant impact both for the female and the male, and so it's important to make sure that you're, make, you're making the most of that shade to maintain higher fertility rates, particularly within a beef suckler herd, fertility is a key indicator of profitability. So there's that very direct link there about how can we make sure we've got a resilient herd going forwards so that we can get used to, even in the northeast of Scotland, these really hot temperatures and how can we keep our cattle happy. Um, linking into that weather picture, uh, dry weather, things like cobalt get locked up in the soil. It's very difficult, even if you have an area where cobalt generally isn't good supply within the soil, as soon as we go into a drought, and it's the same for many minerals, but particularly cobalt, there's been some really interesting research into from Nottingham University, how um, feeding and giving access to willow can significantly address that. Um, so if there are... Um, if there are issues within your within your herd or your flock, if you're doing this with sheep um, and you're wanting to make sure that you've got uh, access to cobalt and you're not wanting to necessarily rely on on licks and boluses, then then willow with sort of willow woodland is is an absolutely brilliant way, like no brainer. Just yeah, get them on the willow. Um, and there are also those other benefits such as salicylic acid. Do you want to skip forward? Sorry, thank you. I realised there was another picture. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, salicylic acid, which is obviously um, painkiller. Uh, um, aspirin, uh, key ingredient, um, but uh, all sorts of different nutrients that are available that aren't necessarily available in the pastures. I guess just on health and welfare, I want to say that we do not uh, provide any minerals, um, so we don't have mineral licks out or blocks um, for our herd. Uh, we don't use, any, we haven't used any wormers in five years. We fecal egg count, um, and we are just getting zero back on fe on the feck or every time. Um, we also do a monthly um, fecal egg count for Fluke, which we're part of a Morden Institute um, uh, sort of trial. And again, I mean, they keep they keep asking me to put them in boggy places. They're like, please, can you put them somewhere wet so we can find something in these dung samples? Um, and they were very much of the opinion that silver pasture was the thing that was keeping the, the Fluke risk down. I actually think it's daily moves. Um, I'm not. I'm not convinced it's a silver pasture, but then they move every day, both through woodland and through through pasture. So for me, I think it's probably more about the daily moves. Um, and then I guess the other thing uh, would just be about um, like health benefits as well and learned behaviours. So the photo um, with the two pictures side by side. So the the cow and calf. Um, the calf there you can see is kind of following mum, learning how to, to, to browse. And actually the photo next to her is her a year later. Um, and she now has calf and it's really beautiful watching her now teaching her calf. Um, those kind of the social behaviours I think really come out in woodland. There's some great research that was done in South America that showed that cattle in woodland actually had much more stable social hierarchies than those in, well, in a silver pasture setting than those just in the plain pasture setting. Um, so it's a really great thing if you're going to introduce new animals to the group, if you're putting your bull in um, with your cows, your heifers, then doing that in woodlands can be, um, you know, we found that that works really well and they just settle down really, really quickly. Um, and so, yeah, it, there are these additional benefits that are just kind of not well known and then you start to see them and you think, oh, I wonder if there's any research into that and you inevitably find that there has been some. Um, it is just the most natural and beautiful thing, I think, to see a cow reaching up to browse from the leaves on a tree. It's, you know, it really made me smile seeing that video. It was really, really beautiful to see that. Um, and I guess one other thing just to say is that I think the best silver pastoral systems are broadleaf woodland plantings that have gone wrong. <laughs> um, so, uh, in fact, all of those photos are all taken on another neighbour's land who put in uh, 130 acres of broadleaf woodland about 35 years ago and just quite a lot of it there were issues around like deer pressure or it didn't really take and it ended up being quite open and that's just like silver pastoral dream it's gorgeous so um yeah I think if you've got woodland broadleaf woodland that maybe isn't um 
hasn't done so well or there are issues around, then it, yeah, just put, put some cows on it. It works really, really well. Super, thank you. I mean, that's a really interesting point. Uh, there's a huge amount of um, press in farming at the moment about woodland planting schemes and how they're being put in, sometimes being put in you know, quite forcibly with fences going up and large blocks being planted. And we have this really w exciting project, which actually comes out of a 20-year-old similar thing where um, a, a dairy farm was planted wall to wall with 2,500 trees a hectare. Um, and I think, um, firstly, there could be opportunity for potential graziers to go and look for these kind of sites. Um, that, that Nikki's picked up uh, and talk about the onward management of those wood, wood, woodlands and whether um, creating wood pasture is a, is, a, is a great opportunity. But also I think there needs to be some really um, detailed thought around the planting proposals that are being put in now and whether the, the integrating of trees into the grazed landscape is the much greater opportunity than the kind of block planting um, approaches. So, uh, because I don't have any idea how the timing is, I think we'd, we'd better get, before we do questions um, and about Nikki's particular bits, if Harriet can tell us about Riverford's interest and the work you're doing establishing new um, trees in pasture, that would be great. Are we giving up on the clicker altogether? Uh, I don't like think it's working. Okay, <laughs> clicker not working. Next slide then, please. Okay. Um, and basically, for this presentation, I just went through my phone and put together all the images I thought were vaguely interesting or had something to tell us. Uh, I don't actually remember what most of them are, though, so oh, I might so have to need to lift your mic oh, closer. Um, right. Um, also, when I get enthusiastic and excited about stuff, it has been suggested that I start to read, reach a sort of speed and pitch that only <laughs> bats and dogs can hear. So if I, if I become incomprehensible, like, wave at me and I'll, I'll try and breathe. Um, so I was just saying um, that basically, for this presentation, I just went through my phone and put together the things that I thought told vaguely interesting stories um, about past kind of agroforestry projects. And this one, I think, is actually pretty repetitive of the kind of thing that, that, that Nikki was saying about like how much livestock actually enjoy being in trees. Um, you can see the image of a really classic like parkland tree um, on one side, where basically the whole herd is trying to hide under that one tree. It's indicating that they enjoy it, but it's not good for you as a farmer, because it means all of your fertility is going under that one tree, and then all of your compaction is happening under that one tree. So if you were introducing more trees um, into that system, you'd be spreading your fertility further across that field. Um, yeah, there's a lot more of there. And, and there's a really nice image that I took in one of their fields last winter, sort of showing the benefit of having um, more trees in your fields for grazing like you can really cle s clearly see in that image how having the trees in the field is protecting the grass growing underneath from the kind of full impacts of winter weather um, and then I have a shot of um, some Galloways, which when the weather was like this and it was really hot and the flies were really getting it to them, I used to spend my entire life trying to hoik out of a eucalyptus plantation because um, eucalyptus is fabulously fast growing, but it's also a natural insect repellent. So as soon as they got really flyy, down would go the fence. They'd be in there like a shot, like rubbing up on the insect repellent and actually having a nibble, which is a bit surprising for eucalyptus, but you know. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I think basically uh, what you know I'm going to talk more about is introducing trees into existing pasture. Like you know, one of the top things obviously to consider is the density of your tree planting and how it suits your farm system. So you can see a really dense new planting here. That's going into a, a pastured kind of poultry system. So that's one of our egg producers. You know, chickens are actually naturally a forest animal. They like quite a high density of woodland cover. Unlike cows, they're quite small, um, so they can kind of navigate their way through a much higher higher density of, of planting as well. Um, you can see, actually, you probably can't see. <laughs> um, this is not the best image. Uh, we've got two other kind of examples in there. Um, the top one being a much more widely spaced kind of chestnut silver pasture system. Um, so chestnuts, are, you know, bigger trees, you need to put them in in a much wider spacing. I still think, that, you know, they work really well for kind of a cattle browsing system. Um, up to you. Uh, with bigger trees, like we've been planting walnuts and chestnuts recently, I've been tending to put them in on about a 16 or 15 meter grid um, so I think 16 meters uh, for walnuts like we don't want them making making contact with each other because we want the full kind of nut productivity um, chestnuts I think you could put them on a slightly wider spacing but they can also be coppiced down so if you're gonna if you're thinking that you might coppice some of your trees you can get away with putting them on a slightly kind of higher density spacing um, and then at the bottom of if you if you can make them out as some hazel uh, hidden in a, a strip 
in a, in a herbal lay. And I think, personally, my general philosophy is if you're planting into permanent pasture, plant in clumps, plant in groups. Like Trees like to be into, in community. Like Look at your landscape and kind of try and work out where some pretty and nicely aesthetically pleasing clumps can be made. Um, we're currently doing battle with an English Woodland Creation Grant, which technically you are not supposed to be able to use for agroforestry, but I'm going to maintain that if you kind of jig it appropriately, it's doable. Um, but if you're planting into something you want to cut, like whether you're doing like an arable herbal lay rotation, whether it's just like straight herbal lay or rotating with another crop, like keep the line straight, make your contractor happy. Um, and again, like the different density of planting. So hazelnuts, we've planted on a kind of three meter basis. Um, if you're planting it there to be a browse bar, you just uh, basically you're put essentially just putting it in an infield hedge, so you could plant uh, a much higher density basis. Or again, like if you're putting in um, uh, uh, trees for a kind of for another crop, obviously you want to space them out a bit more widely than three meters. Um, next slide, please. Um, so tree establishment, just some images of the kind of tree establishment experience over the last couple of years. Um, so um, if, if we go back to that kind of image in your mind of the silage strip that I was just talking about, a couple of years ago, I put in an agroforestry field and we're like, right, we want these lines to be really nice and straight, really easy to plant into, to be subsoiled uh, rows across the field to plant the trees into using the GPS on the tractor. In principle, that works brilliantly. Like it helps break up the compaction, nice straight row, really easy to chop your roots into. In reality, terrible idea. Um, really dry spring, quite clay soil, and basically the row just baked open, and it became this amazing place to attract all of the local slugs to. And following the local slugs came the local voles, and then they had this incredible subterranean highway where they just ran up and down, unpredated, on and ate every single one of my rubles. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you live and learn, and the, the way I have learned um, is the kind of middle picture so, which is to subsoil two rows about a metre apart and then plant your tree in the middle. So you're getting all the benefit of the straight lines being made. You're getting the breaking up of any kind of plough pan or something in the field so the trees can get their roots down. You are doing a little bit more labour on the digging of the hole, um, but you are not getting the voles in quite the same way, and that turned out to be pretty critical. Um, when it comes to digging the hole, like you can see some pictures there. We've got the mini digger out. That was, you know, relatively kind of um, it's in part because we had bought pot-grown trees and they were quite big, um, and so we needed a slightly bigger hole. If you're buying like nice native bare root trees, they often have a smaller root, and you can just kind of put a spade in, wiggle back and forth, and it's sort of okay. Um, oh, wait a minute. Um, there's an image there of an auger. Um, so one of our suppliers who planted 900 trees this autumn um, used an auger to make all of the holes. Um, I haven't reached a fixed position on the auger. It was incredibly efficient in terms of time compared to kind of digging or using the mini digger. But I have read um, that particularly in a kind of clay soil, it can make it harder for the trees um, to get their roots out laterally. But maybe there are advantages to that, like particularly if you're doing it in a rotation with an arable crop, like you're encouraging them to get their, their roots down and deeper rather than kind of spreading out into the kind of arable part of the, the agroforestry system. I do not have a definitive opinion. Harry's shaking his head, so it suggests that he does. Um, we'll get to that later. Uh, um, and then, the, I mean, you know, the, the, um, we've um, gone in quite heavily for kind of fencing individual trees there. I think... I mean, I love, like, if you're planting an individual tree, love a cactus guard right now. I think if you're going in for, like, a higher density row planting, um, it, it depends what you want to do with that tree. Like, if you want to get into that tree and, like, cut it for coppice or harvest something from it, electric fencing, um, if actually it's there just for browse, stock netting possibly or just a couple of strands of wire and um, also a little bit depends on where you're planting like if you're planting in wetland or an area that's liable to flooding you need to think about that when you decide on your fencing because if it gets flooded regularly the fence can obviously fill up with a lot of gubbins um, and then the final thing i'd say on tree establishment is mulch and, and wood chip um, donut shape not volcano and as much of it as you can possibly get in there um, so we had you know last year was a pretty droughty year in Devon and you could just put your hands in the mulch and just see like in the hedges that have been really well mulched that they were getting in a way and we planted trees with a lot of our suppliers around Devon and where they were having high failures or or um Better, more success, it was almost always down to mulch um, and whether or not they'd use wood chip and how stingy or not they'd been in applying it. Next slide, please. Oh, wait, can I jump in on the mulch just to say jump that in. I saw amazing... I don't know if Ian Horsley's in here, but um, Ian, Ian farms uh, in Worcestershire and he 
uh, uses wool to mulch all of his new planting. I have never seen hedge establishment as phenomenally progressed as it would be within like two years. But wool, yeah, if you've got a load of wool and you don't know what to do with it, just use that if you can't get wood chip. Absolutely incredible. I mean, ideally, I'd say put both together in your compost system. Yes. Yeah. I mean, look, we've got some that have gone for just wool this year, and it's not looking quite as good as the oh. wood chip. It doesn't do quite as well on the grass, um, on like suppressing the grass around the base of the tree as the wood chip. Um, yeah. Oh, just a couple of kind of examples of different guards. Um, so yeah, like I said, I, I quite like the cactus guards for planting it. Um, for individual trees, um, they are a much more expensive kind of upfront cost. Um, you usually, you often see them put in with rebar. Um, that is is super quick um, when it comes to putting them in. It's great for really stony soils. Like if you hit a rock, you just move the rebar around a little bit. Personally though, I found it has a bit of a wobble on it. Um, for like, if actually somebody's like, no, this cactus guard isn't quite off-putting enough for me to not want to rub my ass on it. Like, if it's got a bit too much of a wobble going on. Um, so I've been experimenting with using like timber posts. Um, in this picture, you've got the classic 75 mil round post, but the quality of fencing materials this day, I, I don't know if it's gonna last really. I've, so I've tried clef, clef chestnut again this year, again, a bit more expensive, but it, if it actually lasts the life of the guard, maybe it's worth it. Um, and then the other thing I would say about the cactus guards is I have often found that they're not tall enough um, when they're kind of sat right on the ground. Um, so the idea of, the kind of, of having the plastic guard on the, the base is that as the tree grows, you can slightly kind of hoik um, the guard up with it, so you're getting it out of browsing height, which might work, work particularly well for timber trees. We might want to kind of high, high prune the, the timber up. Um, electric fencing um, is much cheaper, much more affordable. If you're like Nikki and you're moving your stock every day and you're really on it, you're there, you're with your stock, and it's not part of a bigger team or a bigger farm system, I think it's fine. I think it's great. Loved and the no-fence collars look great. I think if you have a lot of members of your team or a lot of people operating on your farm, if the trees are your passion and your project, but they're moving the stock, stay away from electric fencing because they're, if they're not invested in the trees, their enthusiasm for going out and making sure all the fencing is working as it should before they just shove, shove the animals in with the trees probably isn't there. And that's where you end up with problems like this. Yeah, which is just a, a trashed electric fence. Um, yeah, and that's uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, this is kind of the future and a little bit the kind of future of um, silver pasture and, and agroforestry, which is this is my colleague Anna and a, a local um, student who came to us from Plymouth University. Um, and whenever we're putting um, agroforestry systems now into an existing permanent pasture, we are soil sampling as we go. And the reason we're doing that is because Mm, agroforestry carbon, like, is that something that's going to be there in the future? We want to make sure we have the data available to us on how putting that agroforestry system in has influenced our soil carbon. So if that ever does come, you know, either we have the evidence that we can contribute to the development and of an agroforestry carbon code, or we can just show people that the benefit that these trees had um, on our soil carbon. And as you can see, that, that tree is very nicely mulched and is doing quite well. I, I might have another slide. I'm not really sure. Um, next one. Is there, is there another one? He's, uh, no, okay. Um, the, the slide that I thought I might have, but maybe it was the previous slide, um, is stuff will go wrong. I, I, I mean, maybe it's just me, but for me, stuff goes wrong a lot. Um, <laughs> like the main thing that I would say about why it goes wrong is it's almost always communication. Um, like, and it's, it's, it's passing on and kind of, it's trying to pass on and communicate knowledge. It's communicating with other members of staff. It's, you know, it's making sure that you've sort of spoken to your contractor who's using that field and you've agreed the width rows of the trees. Um, it's doing enough communication with people who've done this before you to kind of learn about all the mistakes or to imbibe all of their amazing forestry knowledge. Um, yeah, something, some things will go awry, but as much as possible, like try and communicate with every possible stakeholder that is going to be involved in the system to make it the best possible system it can be. Thank you very much. Wow, really key information there. And I, my takeaway there is donut, not volcano. That, that's <laughs> really useful stuff. Donut is um, always the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I've noted down some questions, but I've also just had the 10 minute flag and I'm really keen to get questions from you guys. So I'm just gonna ask one question to each of you. Um, Nikki, in our woodland, you talked a little bit about canopy density and grass growth and how things may, might not necessarily happen how you might expect. Um, but also on sort of coppice and natural regeneration, what we've got uh, up to 1,500 stumps a hectare, uh, which is difficult for driving around in. Um, but 
lots of them are starting to coppice. And I'm hoping on the mob grazing system that those coppice will continue to develop and we're going to get a kind of a shrub layer develop in, in what's a fairly uniform woodland. So what, what's your experience on um, openness, um, natural regeneration, coppicing and, and grazing pressure? Um, do you have figures? I, uh, I know we love figures, I don't, and they're I don't not have always easy. Figures, mate. That's a session for next year, right? Okay. Then we can do that. <laughs> um, but uh, I think, yeah, we're seeing some great natural regen under birch, which is predominantly. Um, I, I would say Rowan, but in England you say Rowan, so Rowan uh, <laughs> coming under birch. Um, and uh, we're also seeing quite a lot of birch regen happening around the outside of woodlands, which is really interesting. And then obviously things like blackthorn um, and hawthorn suckering, which lots of people get really stressed about. And I just think it's amazing. I just love the fact that plants do that. And you can kind of create these really dense, lovely, shrubby, scrubby layers. Um, so yeah, the biggest issue and the biggest challenge in terms of natural regen isn't actually live stock I don't think as long as they're moved frequently it's the deer that will inevitably come in afterwards so that's something that yeah I, we haven't mentioned and actually is really important is to have like a very depending on where you are a deer management plan for that woodland because they will undo the good work that you're doing with cattle We'd, we've definitely seen that and squirrels um, yeah okay squirrels, yeah. yeah um yeah, got very used to living somewhere with lots of red squirrels, <laughs> so not not an issue. But yeah, totally forgot that that would be a be a real challenge. Um, but yeah, so I'd say that the the natural regeneration we're seeing really good um, levels of that. The the scrub layer and that intermediate level is really interesting, and I think that's something that um, y when you're managing within that woodland and you are seeing those kind of um, stands coming back that's going to be up to you to decide how you use browse pressure to, to manage that. That's going to be really exciting to see. And I think that's what we, you know, we all have to be able to do that. It's about power of observation, tweaking your management. And that's what another reason why daily moves are amazing, because if you cock it up somewhere, which is inevitable, as we, as we know, that the next day you can, you can give them a bigger area or you can move them after 12 hours instead of 24 hours or whatever it is, you know, you can make that, that management change. And I think that's what's really important. And one of the reasons why, even if you're using no fence, you've got to get out on the ground every day to see that because these are ecosystems that take quite a long time to develop. You know, we're talking about change happening quickly, but actually kind of compared to just grass, trees, you know, is, is a longer process, but it can be very quickly put back or undone. So I think really frequent close inspection management and adjustment is is key yeah, yeah. Um, and Harriet um, sorry to you, you've given us loads of really fantastic practical information for starting afresh um, could you talk a little bit more about because I know you've done some work with um, stewardship as well and and how you can get support um, and and build things you talked about the English uh, woodland creation is there any key bits of info you'd you'd give us there on if there's financial support available or if this is if policy is starting to move to help, because agroforestry has often fallen between forestry policy and, and agriculture <laughs> policy, and yep. is that moving? Um, I mean, it's changed significantly. Like when we first did our, like when I first did my agroforestry project, um, it, like there was still the concern that you'd lose your BPS if you had agroforestry systems, and we were still like fighting that campaign, um, and that was only in like 2017, and that's no longer the case. That's now, so, I mean, not least because of. Anyway, um, <laughs> like, um, and and we are expecting at some point, hopefully, the new agroforestry like SFI standards to appear, like I uh, uh, late this year or kind of early 2024. So we very much look forward to that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean the the payment changes that were made to the existing countryside stewardship scheme um, have made a, a really great difference. Um, the RP of a don't seem very great at answering the question about what qualifies for fruit for the top fruit payment. As far as I'm concerned, walnuts are a go. Um, and it's currently about two grand an acre, a hectare. Um, so um, that's looking pretty cracking in terms of stewardship options. Um, so yeah, and they've, they've also got a lot of funding available for, for protecting of individual trees and planting of individual trees, a lot of riparian buffer funding. Um, there are also a lot of community forests sort of springing up all over the place who have some pretty good deals around for farmers. So we're talking to like Plymouth Community Forest at the moment. We've done a lot of work with the Cornwall Community Forest with suppliers. So look up those local 
local initiatives. And I mean, the big change with the English Woodland Creation Grant is it used to have a, a, I think it was a five hectare minimum um, to be to qualify, which made it a bit challenging for sort of smaller farms. Um, it's now a one hectare minimum, and you don't have to deliver one hectare in one block. That one hectare can be split into 0.1 hectare parcels, and it also doesn't even have to be on one holding. So we are putting in a project at the moment, which is for one hectare of planting across two different SBI numbers, where we're basically just using that to create kind of series of sort of small infield wood pasture systems kind of joining up, providing woodland connectivity across the landscape. You can't graze it for the first 15 years, but probably nor would you want to. Um, um, so I think that's a really good opportunity to establish woodland pasture at the moment. Really, really useful. Thank you very much. Right now, uh, there's a microphone somewhere. Um, super, thank you so well, I just wanted to, just while the microphone's going to the, whoever it's going to, and um, we've mentioned Scottish funding a little bit, we've talked about in England, just to mention in Wales, um, there's obviously moves towards, and I don't know if um, if Tim Pagella's in the audience anywhere, but he would be very knowledgeable about this, um, a move towards 10% forestry, a woodland cover on farms. For me, what an amazing no-brainer to just make sure it's integrated and that it isn't uh, a woodland or pasture i just think it's an incredible opportunity to take that and create like co-productivity from the same space so um yeah my brain's just kicked in and remembered that we actually did a session on the farm woodland forum possibly last week maybe two weeks ago about all of the funding available in scotland england northern ireland the republic of ireland and wales and it can be found on youtube super thank you very much um so do we have a question do we have someone with a microphone somewhere please take it away yeah, hi. Um, so we're uh, poultry, egg, uh, mainly eggs, and on your picture, um, there was quite a high density of uh, planting. Uh, we, we've put in an agroforestry system already, and we've done sort of 10 metre rows and uh, fruit trees every uh, five metres. Um, but I'm quite interested, with the, like, I, I think grass is really important for, for birds. Uh, they, you know, like people say, I don't, they don't eat grass, they, they eat a lot of grass, and the eggs quality goes down if they don't eat grass. Um, when you look at that system where you've got quite high density, the, 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 does the grass grow underneath that? Because I mean that seems quite. I mean that that seems very dense planting. Um, yeah. uh, I think it was your egg um, picture. I Harry. mean, so one thing I would say, and it depends obviously significantly on the cost of the trees you're putting in, but don't be afraid to plant at a much higher density than you intend to use because that those trees will have uses so we we planted a wet woodland for example recently on a on a pasture we planted at a really high density and one of the reasons we did that is because we planted things like willow which we intend to to coppice regularly and take out and then chip and use as our wood chip supply for planting our other trees so just because you're looking at something like that and thinking that's quite a high density planting it, 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 you you will, if you manage that density of planting like either coppice it or ro you know rotation or you can kind of thing it thin it out a bit as necessary um, and the other thing I would say is it, it depends on the, 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 the canopy that you're kind of going to ultimately get um, so it depends what you're planting if you've, if you've got something that's going to give you a really dense canopy that shades out your grass then you'll end up with not very much grass but if you're planting things like um, so we've done quite a lot of observational visits to existing mature walnut tree plantations and walnut gives you a really dappled shade like the eucalyptus actually provided quite like a dappled shade so then you're still seeing the grass growing underneath so th I think it all comes back to like the design of each individual system uh, yeah, I, I guess exactly that thing. I would always, always plant more densely than you inevitably want to end up with. You get so many options. But firstly, if you get, if you do have um, deer pressure or hair or foals, then you can kind of counteract that. Um, I'd also say around chickens just made me realise that um, we've done some really interesting hedge establishment using chickens instead of mulch and actually running hens through the bottom of the hedge. And they are an incredible way to uh, manage um grasses around the bottom of the hedge but also adding you know just putting feed down there just kind of does add um additional nutrients to help the to help the hedge get away so that might also be something to consider when talking about poultry thank you very much um do we have more questions uh, i think this hand went up first hello i just wanted to make a, a point about uh wood pasture systems and i guess the characteristics of them um, and that they're sort of defined by having um, woody scrub dynamics, deadwood habitat, veterinised trees, open-grown oaks and stuff like that. Do you plan on the U Valley Farm to 
maybe do some of these works to allow scrub to come through, create these edge areas, maybe artificial veteranization of trees, etc. Yeah. Um, veteran trees will be difficult for us for a while, um, as the stock is almost all exactly 23 years old. Um, I have wondered about whether we are still in the zone of being able to create some new pollards um, and kind of continue to manage those. Um, I was speaking to um, a forestry contractor about it who said that they're not sure if the trees are on the edge of being too old to be pollarded, but be interesting. Um, certainly, we have um, that woodland, our woodland was planted with um, quite a lot of holly and hazel in it as well. Um, and so I think coppice is going to be really important for us in quite quickly establishing that middle layer that's not there at the moment. Um, but I think certainly we, because we're, we're lucky because of the scale, because it's 400 acres and because there's quite a lot of variation through it, there will be opportunity to, as Nikki was saying, pick areas and, and reduce the, the grazing pressure and allow that to come thicker and potentially the scrub to develop. Um, but uh, yeah, well, I mean, if you've got ideas, I'd be very happy to, to discuss and hear about what your thoughts. But I think trying to establish those features will, will be really interesting in the next phase of development. Thank you. Um, on the, um, that note of um, dedication, if you like, of a wood, um, is there any mileage in going in there with a sort of tracked elephant and pushing a few trees over to create some no-go um, zones for your... Yeah. For your um, we, we haven't... Um, as, as, as our in, in terms of the operation for us of thinning the trees, because it's, it's a net cost to us to kind of put that woodland um, right, essentially, as we see it, into the, into the, the um, scenario we want to get to, to start learning about the impact on the cattle, the impact on soil carbon, the, the, the dynamics with the grass. Um, we are, the contractors are taking timber out of that woodland. Um, so... Again, potentially, we, we feel like we've got a big enough platform to create variation and do different things. So potentially, um, you know, pushing things over a bit like chopping tops off things and trying to create pollards could be an interesting thing. Um, but I'd have to get my head around what we were trying to study specifically there, what we were trying to find out um, in terms of the benefits that that bought. And again, really, we're happy to take advice or thoughts on that. Can I add to that a bit, Tom? I think... Um we quite often forget in these systems that, that cattle are a really good uh, tool. Um, I mean, it was really interesting. I had a fantastic conversation with the, the folks who had the bison and you know got the bison over to put into their woods. Um, I was like, I, I could have just sent you some Shetland cows and some Galloways. I mean, they'll just do the same job at knocking them out. It's amazing. Actually, the more that the animals get used to being in woods, the more that they will start to kind of display some of these behaviours that we quite often think... I oh know, but the cattle don't do that. You know, it's a, it's very particular to these other species. So I think, um, yeah, just I'm really keen that we don't, in a lot of the woodland that we're managing, other than we are doing a bit of thinning in some of it, um, just to, to try and open things up and create a bit more of a diverse sward underneath, uh, particularly where there's quite a lot of spruce plantation, um, that letting the cattle do that and taking time to observe it and see what's happening rather than making the assumption that we have to jump in and do something and burn a load of fossil fuels to do that. Let's just see how much the, the animals can do it. And we know that we're going to get kind of more um, challenging storm events coming. You know, I was surprised we didn't have more over this last winter following the previous winter. So I think, you know, that... I, I think we, yeah, just making the assumption that we need to go in and start kind of faffing around with stuff when actually the weather and the animals that we have can do a lot of, a, of that for us. It's more important maybe, f not for everyone, but for us particularly to take the time to observe that, record it, see what happens, and that can inform our learning rather than jumping in. I think the other interesting thing that we've observed um, is that cattle really speed up the cycling of dead wood in our woodland. So when we carry out a thinning operation, there's a lo lot of brash left on the ground. Uh, and actually, the, the one of the really um, loud noises that happened when we put the first lot of cows into the first block in there was that it was quite dry. And there was just a crackling noise as the cows walked around and they pushed this um, brash into the top layer of the soil. Uh, and that's all disappeared very quickly in the blocks that are uh, kind of a year or 18 months post thinning that's all pretty much disappeared now so I think the the impact of cattle will be really interesting uh, and, and the dynamic of dead wood might change slightly in these scenarios uh, any other questions I saw the um, well we'll take one here and then and then the hand with with the hat 
Thank you. I just wanted to ask whether you've had an increased risk of TB from badgers in the woodland amongst the cattle. Um, we have had no problems so far. Um, we'll obviously monitor that. Um, yeah, no is the answer so far, thankfully. We have a woodland that's predominantly ash, and it's about 60-year-old ash, uh, and it is suffering some of it with ash dieback. We've done a thinning, uh, and we've had a few wind-blown ones and branches down, and as a result of the thinning, we've now got a hell of a lot of bramble. Uh, you were saying just now, you know, do you let the cattle in there with that bramble, or do you try and get rid of the bramble before you put the cattle in? Well, uh, just firstly, I'll, I'll, before I ask Nikki what she thinks, <laughs> or, or, or Harry, um, I do. Um, we've got bramble as well. Um, perhaps because um, our woodland is only 20 years old, we still had a lot of seed bank that was that was dairy pasture, essentially. Um, but we do have bramble, and we have we did a bit of targeted um, bramble bashing this winter, and those are some of the areas that we have put some seed onto. Um, and we've also had mad conversations like whether pigs or goats might be be helpful. We haven't gone there yet, but Nikki, what what do you think in terms of? I would say that bramble is cheaper than fencing. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd be planting my ash alternatives into the bramble and leaving it be. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. And I guess it's about like what what do you want to happen there? Like you know, like why why would you want why would you not want bramble? If it's a woodland, would you, you know, because actually it's going to pr it's going to provide habitat. It's going to provide it's a role has a role within the succession of that woodland. So I guess it's in, and like you know it's just about being clear on that. What do we want to happen in this place? Do we want it to be pasture? Um, do we want it to be woodland? Do we want scrub? So I think you have to define your out. You have to define what you want first. And I would always, always, always use the animals if you've got animals. Use them as a, a way to do that rather than expending energy trying to create something for them because they they'll do it for you i think harry had a question in the blue shirt well with no, the, no, oh. okay. it did have a lot of primrose in it before uh, and the first very light thinning really encouraged the low ground flora and it was absolutely beautiful and now these brambles are chest high and you can't see any of the lovely ground flora that was there before yeah, but, I, but as I said, it's about what do you want because, yeah. you know, ground floor is gorgeous, really beautiful, but it creates no habitat for nesting birds, whereas bramble will. So it, yeah, I think it's what's important is that we define what we're managing for, like what do you want your outcome to be? And maybe you want your outcome just to be succession, to be able to happen. Yeah. Maybe you want ground flora. So that's the important bit. It's about defining what you're managing for. And then I would personally always promote the use of animals as a tool to achieve that. It, un unless it's impossible to so do so. If you wanted the primroses, would you give direction on like managing of how you manage the stocking density of the woodland essentially to achieve that? Yeah, because I guess if you if you want to get if you want to remove the bramble entirely, then you'd probably concentrate animals on there on that bramble, maybe using electric fence um, to to kind of focus their attention in those areas, and you might want to strategically place access to water, or if you're using them, mineral licks in places so that they're really going to go through and, and do that. Um, there's some really great examples of people using um, bramble to kind of open back out um, bluebell, kind of bluebell woodlands where the bramble's coming in. So I think, yeah, there's lots of ways that you can focus attention on those particular areas if you want to, if you want to manage that. I, I very rarely would ever say, you know, go and spend time and money and fossil fuels on doing a job that animals can do for you, probably because I'm just really tight and don't like spending money on stuff like that. Super, thanks. Okay, I think we've probably got time for one or two more. Um, Harry, Harry had a question. Harry had a question. Or Harry. a statement. I Waving. have one here. Sorry. <laughs> You're in my blind spot. It was less of a statement, more. more. I mean, this is an agricultural uh, conference, but, but for, for me, to, talking about it, and you, so you were starting to touch on it, um, you know, you're moving into a really interesting stage, and there's masses of thousands and thousands of acres of the kind of uh, the thousands and thousands of acres of the poor quality forestry that, that are out there. But what you've done is amazing, and I, actually the other two talks were just amazing, and I really appreciate them. So thank you very much. What I was going to talk is, is about canopy management. So you, you didn't talk really; you were sort of touching on it faintly about 
ideas of pollarding and um, you do sort of mention in passing or thinning contractors, but you know, it is that, how are you gonna start to look at that uh, piece of uh, wood pasture and start to think in terms of canopy management, which was historically done uh, for the people who were looking at ancient woodland and, and stuff because people were doing the pollarding and there was a market for the pollards and you're now faced with a different problem. And I wonder how you're sort of looking at that. Well, I suppose, to take it back to Nikki's kind of point about us setting the context of what we're trying to get to. I mean, uh, one of our pr real motivators um, is to create a beef system within this woodland to show that we can um, put our arms around the um, beef that comes out of our dairy herds and raise them in a really positive way, um, create a platform that's resilient to the weather that's coming towards us, um, and also to sequester carbon and, and enhance biodiversity. So we, I guess, are trying to make sure that we are producing forage we're trying to get to the point where we're producing quite a lot of grass so the canopy is going to be really important in that but i, I, I don't want to i don't want to avoid the question but i think what we're in this phase where we're two years in and everything is changing massively quickly we're really lucky that there is variation there are areas because of what the way that the ash was planted there are some areas that are quite open and there are some areas that are much more closed. Um, and so I, do, I don't have the answer about what the, what the sweet spot is for us because we're gonna have to observe the productivity and actually the way that the trees now react to having been opened up and given space. But we, um, we are looking, uh, we have done some early work with um, somebody who we haven't quite got on board yet to do some, some um, really detailed um, laser scanning of tree density um, and understanding really so that we can put that together with the production. Say, so what, what actually is the canopy there? How much light's getting to the ground? And do we think that that's producing the kind of grass sort that we can produce off? So that's, uh, I don't have those answers yet, but we hope that we have the platform where we'll have enough variability to say, that's what's delivering, uh, and that's what's doing something different effectively. Maybe you'll get the answers if you went to the agroforestry show on the 6th and 7th of Aug uh, September, not August. I was thinking we had to get that plug in. <laughs> Definitely do that. Okay, one more down at the front here, please. Hi, um, I had a quick uh, question for your project, Tom, uh, which is really interesting, by the way, um, about obviously the uh, wildlife benefits of thinning woodland can be vast, and to some extent, the well, the wild, the bigger open bits are really essential. Uh, but the Forestry Commission can be quite, um, well, wooden, pun intended, on their definition of what constitutes woodland. Did you have trouble getting permission to uh, thin or reduce the number of trees, or were you, re were you restricted with how many trees you could take out? We, 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 we weren't restricted. We have, um, we have, we're allowed to thin the woodland, which is due, and we have dead trees, which we have to deal with. If we were kind of trying to cover the whole strata of different densities, we'd probably like to have some lower canopy densities, but we have to keep them above well, somewhere between 30 and 50%. So we, we don't have anything that's lower than that effectively. And that might be, you know, if we wanted to see the full spectrum of wood pasture, you know, botanical communities and stuff, we might like to have some of those more open areas. And perhaps that's where planting into permanent pastures gives us the opportunity to fill in that blank. But essentially, it's a woodland and it, and it has to stay as a woodland and we are trying to manage it within that kind of um, confine. We're done, okay. Thank you, um, uh, we, we've reached uh, the end of the time um, for discussing this. Um, I don't know if Nikki has to shoot right off to another talk, you know, um, so, but certainly I'm gonna hang around for a little while. Um, so if anybody wants to come and chat, then do. Um, so all that really remains to be said is uh, thank you very much to everybody for coming. <laughs> and a huge, huge thank you um, to Nikki and to Harriet for coming and sharing their, their knowledge and experience.